ranging from a fixed magnification battle sight to reflex sights with the latest power management features. Purpose built and versatile. Find yours at crimsontrace.com. Want to shoot off your mouth? This is the place. It's Gun Talk. Call 866-TALK-GUN. Hey, glad you could be with us. I'm Tom Gresham. I am the host here. It's called Gun Talk because, well, we talk about guns. Frankly, here's the deal. If you have a question about guns, call us. If you have a gun you want to tell us about, call us. It could be your grandfather's gun that somebody left you that you, you know, it's been handed down. Or if you're just concerned and you're thinking, maybe I ought to buy a gun for self-defense. I keep hearing about all this crime out there. The answer may not be what you think. In fact, I may not agree that you need a gun. Sometimes that happens. It depends on circumstances. But I can help you work your way through the process. You need a guide. You need a counselor. You need somebody who can say, okay, let's, let's play 20 questions here, figure out where you are. So I'll help you with that. And if you're just looking for what, Tom, what would be a really cool new gun for me to get? Man, can I help you out there? A lot of new things being introduced. Just this week, we had introductions from, let's see, Sig, Colt, Mossberg, Savage, Ruger, maybe some others that I've missed in the process. A lot of things going on. So there, I mean, there you go. As we look at the landscape for 2020, and we look at how gun rights factors into all of this, and of course, a number of the Democratic candidates are very much anti-gun rights, anti-gun owner, not anti-gun, anti-gun owner, that is, they don't like you, they don't trust you, as they say, well, we don't really know who you are, how can we trust common people, ordinary people, to provide for their own protection? We have to have trained people, people wearing uniforms. Of course, more, more people die in car accidents than they do are murdered with guns. And if they think that you're incapable of providing your own protection with a gun, do they think you're incapable of driving safely? Maybe you should have a police officer drive you around. <laughs> At least that was the argument made by Ray Elgin, our buddy in uh, the newsletter piece this week. I hope, you're, I hope you're getting our newsletter. It's free. It comes weekly by email. You go to guntalk.com. You can sign up for our newsletter. We've got a lot of interesting things. I actually included a fairly lengthy take that I had on this whole Texas church shooting this week. Takeaways, things you can learn, how we could all get better, maybe rededicate ourselves to being better at this. If you have any questions about that, or if you want to talk about that church shooting and the reaction to it, by all means, give us a shout. 866-TALK-GUN. All right. As we look at the gun rights movement, and we see all these sanctuary counties and cities popping up, Second Amendment sanctuaries, places where they say, well, we're just not going to enforce your unconstitutional gun laws. You see a lot of the moms to man groups over there, and it, it, the media makes it look like, well, you know, all women... All women want more gun control. They want more restrictions on gun owners. Well, I don't think that's the case. Stephanie Lord's joining us right now. She's the founder and president of Pro Gun Women. Hey, Stephanie, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. And you are absolutely sure. right. There's a whole bunch of us women out here that are very pro gun. Okay, well, obviously the media has ignored that. So what are you doing about that? Oh, my gosh. They, yeah, you see, so that's the frustrating part is the media ignores a lot of stuff, pretty much like the Moms Demand Action women do, too. They put out a lot of stats and a bunch of false reports, and I'm constantly having to battle that. That's the first thing. But secondly, what I'm trying to do is this small, incremental grassroots is starting to spread, you know, to all different states. And I think that's mm -hmm. the only way we're going to get it done until we have our voices so big they can't ignore us anymore. There is a role to be played for Second Amendment women. I know that uh, Diana Muller created the D.C. Project, and that takes you know, 50 women, one from each state, that goes to D.C. every year and talks to congressmen and uh, you know, makes that effort. The, the idea, idea behind that, and I think I'm going to suppose the idea behind what you're doing with pro-gun women, is that... It's unexpected. Uh, to a lot of people out there, the media and the public, they're just, they go to that immediate position of, well, women, of course, want more gun control. And when you come out and say, no, no, actually, what we want is responsible gun ownership, and we want fewer controls, uh, I'm guessing that you get some interesting reactions. Tell me about that. 
Well, you know, I tell you, so far, all the reactions have been very positive. The only people I get, um, yeah, surprisingly, the only people who come for me, and they usually don't for some reason. I don't really get that much uh, backlash. I get um, any candidate or or politician that's running who's Mm anti-gun, of course, might say something about me. But for the most part, uh, not really. They they haven't come for me. And actually, the media has been very pleasant to me in New Mexico. So, So far, knock on wood. All right, you're starting starting this in New Mexico, but you want to take it national. Describe the Absolutely. group. What is it, and how did you get started on this? Okay, so when we, we moved from Idaho. We used to live in Idaho, and we moved here to New Mexico. And when we came down here, we thought, okay, this state's okay. It's very, very blue, right? But it's an anomaly in that the Democrats here are very conservative and gun tones. So we thought, no problem. Mm-hmm. And then we've got a crazy governor. I mean, she is as progressive as progressive can be. And so they threw Mm -hmm. all these gun bills, eight, at us in one session. So I was going up there with the sheriffs and other people, and we're like, what in the heck is going on here? And what made me the most frustrated is I would look over in the sea of red, right, the mom's man action. So I started talking to them. A bunch of them are not even from here. They're from Texas, came in on buses or however they got there. Yeah, I I talked to one woman that tried to recruit me for their side because when she found out I was a survivor of domestic violence and had been stalked, she thought, oh, well, you should come to my side. I said, oh, heck no. I'm I'm a survivor. I want to carry. I want to protect myself at all times. And so in New Mexico, we have a whole bunch of gun-toting people, and we have a bunch of women that are leading the fight here for patriotism. So they're behind me 100%. So I have a whole bunch of men and women behind me, and they love that I would go up and confront these people. So the whole thing is I want to counter them because they're the only voices being heard. They come up mm-hmm. for women and think they're representing us. They do not. They don't represent us. Well, you make you made an interesting point. I've been talking about this for a long time. A lot of the women who you're seeing, they're wearing their red shirts, their mom's man action, or every town shirts. They're actually being bust in with the Bloomberg millions of dollars. It is, I call it AstroTurf. It's not grassroots. Uh, they're being, in some cases, they're actually being paid, but it's certainly their way is being paid on the whole deal. It's being organized on a, and, and look, Shannon Watts, who runs all this deal, she is a marketing person. She's very good at marketing. She's not a gun rights or a, a gun control person. She's just a marketing person, and she's got all this Bloomberg money behind her. But tell me about what happens when you talk to women who are sympathetic to what you're saying. Are they willing today, these days, to actually stand up, show up, and speak up? Oh, yeah, they're on fire. Let me tell you. So this session, they brought, they're bringing back all these gun bills again in a 30-day mm-hmm. budget session. They're bringing back red flag and gun safe storage, and they've added a new one that we can't quite tell what it is. It looks like it's either going to be a scary assault weapon ban, and they did the fingers in the air on that, or it's going to be a trigger ban because you can't quite tell what it is, or a bump stock ban. Anyway, so everyone's mad. They're really angry. They're really fired. And I'm also going to have a rally at the end of the month to kind of fire people up. Uh, you know, on, on the 31st, I want a whole bunch of people to show up and say, hey, we're mad. We're not going to take this anymore. This is New Mexico. You're not going to infringe on our rights anymore. So, yeah, I've got a lot of women who are ready to come, and they are ready to speak out. Where, where's the uh, rally? What time? Where? It's going to be on January 31st at 11 o'clock, and it's going to be at our state capitol, and it'll be outdoors. Yep. Okay, 11 o'clock, January 31st at the state capitol. Uh, how do people find out more about your group? Do you have a, an online presence? I do, and here's the most frustrating part. Uh, my website is down for a minute. I don't know what is going on, but it is progunwomen.org. I should have that back up shortly. I do, I'm do. i also on Twitter at progunwomen. I'm on Facebook at Pro-Gun Women, and um, those, those are two of the primary that I use, Facebook and Twitter. Okay, so just and look for Pro-Gun a... Women. Uh-huh. Yeah, because I, in fact, it's funny you mentioned that, because I went to your website, and it said it was down. I went, okay, something's going on here, so I hope you get that worked out. But in the meantime, I'm... people can go to yeah. Facebook and find you that way, Pro-Gun Women there. I, yeah, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. You are one of those people who refuses to just be patted on the head and say, it's going to be fine. You're standing up. You're not going to take it. Good for you. You know, when I'll tell you what, if you show up with 50 or 100 women there, you know what you're going to do? You're going to win. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's my goal. I want as many people as possible, especially my, my goal is to get more and more women 
speaking out at these events because it's really hard for yes. them to argue. They can't say, well, the moms are saying this. I'm like, Mm-mm, no, I got a whole bunch of moms behind right. me too. So. Right, exactly right. Stephanie Lord, thank you so much. Pro Gun Women, I appreciate it. Uh, keep pressing, it's a good thing to do. All right, quick break here 866 Talk Gun, and uh, we will uh, be back in just a minute. When the U.S. military's elite units and law enforcement agencies across the globe demanded innovation and reliability, they didn't settle. They chose Sig Sauer. When world champion professional shooters demanded precision accuracy, they didn't settle. They chose Sig Sauer. So it's no surprise more and more civilian gun owners are refusing to settle for anything less. They're choosing Sig Sauer firearms, ammunition, electro-optics, suppressors, air guns, and training. Sig Sauer. Never settle. Perhaps more than any other landscape, wetlands embody the life-giving abundance that nature has to offer. And perhaps more than any other organization, Ducks Unlimited is working to ensure that our continent's wetlands not only survive, but thrive for generations well beyond this one. The time is now to band together. The time is now to rescue our wetlands. It's the Bill of Rights, not the Bill of Needs. I'm Alan Gottlieb, founder of the Second Amendment Foundation. When someone says we don't need that kind of gun, remind them the Founding Fathers determined what rights our Constitution should protect. There's a world of difference between rights and needs. It is not the function of government to tell us what we need or what we don't. Certainly no one needs an assault rifle or a Saturday Night Special, or for that matter, no one needs a Corvette with a high-capacity horsepower engine capable of speeds to 150 miles per hour. But in the hands of honest, responsible individuals, we have the right of choice. We have the right to read books others don't like. We have the right to listen to any radio program we choose. We have the right to dress the way we want to. We also have the right to own firearms of our choice. So the next time someone tells you, you don't need something, tell them. It's the Bill of Rights, not the Bill of Needs. Join the Second Amendment Foundation today so that this message and our Bill of Rights might live. Call 425-454-7012. That's 425-454-7012. Since 1994, Crimson Trace has defined and built the laser sighting category through design, innovation, and performance. With an obsession to create best-in-class electro-optics, Crimson Trace now offers a full line of lasers, lights, reflex sights, red dot sights, and rifle scopes for tactical and sport applications. Most Crimson Trace products include free batteries for life, and all scopes are backed by a lifetime warranty. Find yours at your local dealer or at crimsontrace.com. Interesting, I, um, in the ma- aftermath of this Texas church shooting, Jack Wilson is identified as the man who shot and killed the murderer. They do have the murderer's name out there. I'm not going to use it. Hope everyone will refrain from that. I don't want to give him any kind of notoriety whatsoever. A man that, according to the history, had lots of history of uh, mental illness. People knew about it. He'd been incarcerated, he'd been arrested, he'd been charged, he'd been plea bargained down to misdemeanors. They let him out again. Wasn't supposed to have a gun. They don't know how he got it yet. Ex-wife said, yeah, we knew he was crazy. We just didn't know he was that crazy. No, I'm not, really, that's what she said. No kidding. We knew he was crazy. We just didn't know he was that crazy. A lot of lessons to be learned. I hope that everybody's looking at the video, thinking about it, understanding what do I need to do? How do I get better? Commit to training. 2020, the year of training, money and time, time and money. That's all there is. Put money and time into training. Training is not practice, by the way. Training is going and getting professional training, okay? Line three, let's talk to Chad out of Jackson, Mississippi. I know who this is, I bet. Hey, Chad, is this you? Hey, Rob. Hey, Tom. Hey, yeah, it's Chad over here. How are you, Tom? Ch- Ch- Chad, is, uh, he's got a head of operations over at the Boondocks Training Academy there, where we have been, spent a lot of time there. I appreciate you being here, friend. Well, I'm glad I got a chance to call in today. You know, I've been listening to you talk on the radio about the, the, the church shooting thing, and, and it's something I, I lead my church security team, and we've been we've been going over this stuff and looking over the, the issues that, that happened there. And, 
you know, one of the things is, is the important thing is just being able to, to carry the right gear so you can get shots on target quickly. I mean, there was a, a three-second delay from the guy that got – let me pull the shotgun out for the first shot. And, you know, those poor guys didn't have a chance. They had their guns buried deep in their, in their, in their carry gears and didn't get a chance to get out and get a shot on target. So – well, you know, one of the things you do there at Boondocks, and I just let people know, this is just outside of Jackson, Mississippi, and it is a really fine training facility with really good instructors, and I would encourage anybody in the area to absolutely uh, go take advantage of Boondocks. But one of the things I've been seeing you doing, watching you on Facebook, is you're really working on the time it takes to get a first shot off from concealment. Talk, if you would, about that, how you are working on that and kind of what your goal is. Well, you know, I mean, the the goal is to 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 get that first shot off. You know, we we where I work, I'm fortunate enough to talk to train with a lot of the top trainers around the country. And you know, Tom Gibbons is out there a few uh, a few times, and he's always said three shots, three yards, three seconds. That's that's what your gunfight is going to be. And and I'm trying to get underneath that, you know, that one second draw to get that first shot out of the holster and on the on the uh, on the target in one second. And then, you know, it's it's a matter of making sure your gear works. It's a matter of making sure that all your posturing is, is right, that you can clear your cover garment, that you can get the grip on your gun. All of those things are important. And unless you get some professional help to learn where you can cut out some inefficiencies, you know, you're going to have a three-second draw, a four-second draw, and sometimes that's not enough. So. It's interesting. You're a firearms trainer. You teach concealed carry. You teach this stuff, and yet you actually learn from these other trainers. And, you know, I keep saying to people, what you get when you go to a trainer is a, an informed and experienced set of eyes who can look at you because it's, unless you're like a Rob Latham, he can diagnose himself. But for the rest of us, we don't, we don't actually know what we're doing, do we? That's right. And, you know, I mean, I was, I was about a one and a half second draw and we had a gentleman come in, uh, in October, Brian Hill out of Atlanta. And he made me change one little thing. And that one little change got me to a sub second draw. And now I was getting two shots off on target as fast as I was getting one shot off before that because of one little thing he noticed that I was doing that was an inefficiency in my draw. What did he see? What did you change? Uh, one of the big things he changes was that he noticed that when I started drawing from my holster that I was, I was dropping lower than my starting stance. So I, what was, and what was causing uh. that to happen was I wasn't being able to pick my front side up as, front, as fast because – when I was dropping my body and bringing my gun up, I was trying to chase my front sight on the presentation. But by dropping my body lower before I drew the gun, the sight came right up in my uh, in my in my in my line of vision, and I was able to get that first shot off a lot quicker on target just by changing my where I started from, how I started my standing and, position. And and you didn't even know you were doing that, did you? No, I didn't know I did that. I mean, we had some video on it from the day before, and so when he mentioned it, I went back at home that night and looked at the video, and I tried and tried and tried for that sub-second draw, and I tried that day, and I couldn't get it, and I went back and looked at the video, and then we talked about it the next morning, and that afternoon, I was able to get a .94 draw, you know, which is, is pretty good for my concealment. So. Yeah, and we're, and we're talking .9. That is reaction time. That's from the beep of the timer, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. So that's including including reaction time. Chad, from a church security standpoint, and you know, you're on the team there, you also are a trainer, you've looked at the video of Jack Wilson. What did you learn from that? What's your takeaway? What are you passing along to people? Well, you know, I looked at the church video and, and you could tell that they were concerned about him because there was three or four guys that had gathered around him and they knew he was an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when he got up and started moving towards the, the gentleman in the back that was doing communion, um, you know, he, he was actually going to pull this, he pulled the shotgun out and I believe he was going to shoot the gentleman in the communion first, but the other guy stood up and that standing up drew his attention off the first guy and to the second guy. And there was a three second delay there. And the guy was trying to get his holster, his gun out of his holster. And he was trying to do a one handed draw and struggle with that draw. And then the mm-hmm. other guy in the, doing the communion in the back, the second gentleman that got shot, he got his gun out and got a shot off. But that was a four-second delay in there, and he was actually close enough that if he would have, if he would have had the mindset to just rush the guy and bring him to the ground, he may have saved not only his life but his fellow church member' life as well. And you got to talk to your guys about, All right, guys, just because you got a gun doesn't mean it's the only option you have. You know, it's a lot yep. quicker to take somebody out if you're in a th- within three yards or four yards. You can take them down a lot quicker than you're going to be able to get your gun out of the holster. 
And, you know, I mean, I'm not faulting them. I'm just saying that it, unless you've practiced that, unless you've thought about how you're going to react, unless you've timed yourself, unless you know, hey, man, I can, I can cover this distance a lot quicker than trying to dig this gun out of three layers of clothing, then you're not going to know. And you're going to say, I've got a gun, and I'm going to try to solve this with a problem with the gun, and it's not always right, right, that easy. Right. So. You know, and if you get control of that muzzle of that shotgun, maybe you push it down, maybe you push it up, maybe you rush him, you bull rush him, get him against a wall, knock him to the ground, you stop the whole thing. But again, like you say, you have to have been through this training and where people say, okay, if you're this close, the solution may not be your gun. Maybe you just grab the guy and take right. him down. But again, if you've not been exposed to that, you, that's the kind of thing you probably are not going to come up with on your own. And also, I would just tell you, None of these solutions are you going to come up with on your own quickly if you haven't practiced it, trained with it, and thought about it many, 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 many. I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of times you've run right. this, these scenarios through your head and going, if this happens, I will do that. If this happens, I will do that. And then when it starts happening in your mind, you've already been there a thousand times, and you know exactly what to do. Right. And, you know, we teach active shooter training as well, and we teach people what to do if they don't have a gun. But it wasn't until I went and did First Person Defender earlier or last year in 2019 that I kind of said, hey, you know what? I can kind of put these two things together. Even though I've got a gun on me, a training gun on me, it wasn't my first option. And, you mm -hmm. know, after, after my first scenario in the, in, the, uh, in the First Person Defender stuff, you know, I realized, hey, I'm close to this guy. I grabbed this gun, and, and you know, I grabbed the gun from Ryan and took, him out, took the gun out of the mix and stopped the robbery without ever having to fire a shot, right. which is kind of what we want to do. So, um, you know, it's... Even though I've, I've done force on force stuff, we play a lot of bad guy stuff, but being in the good guy role really made me think, hey, I can take my active shooter training, how to control people, yep. and my training with the firearm and know when to hey, put in hey, which tactic. Hey, Ch hey Chad, what's the, what's the website for Boondocks, real quick? It's boondocksfta.com. That's boondocksfta is in firearms training academy.com. All right, very good. Chad, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, Brad, don't go anywhere in Utah. I want to talk to you as soon as we come back. I want to talk about the Colt Python versus the Dan Wesson revolver. If you have a gun you want to talk about, call us, 866-TALK-GUN. We'll keep talking. You keep reloading. Here's Tom. All right, we got Brad, we got Bill coming up here. Now, don't go anywhere, Bill. Brad, line five out of Utah. I know you've been on hold. I appreciate your patience. Let's talk about 10 millimeters. Or, or not, correction, let's talk about 357s. Uh, Python versus Dan Wesson. What's on your mind? Yeah, I'd be curious to know if you put the new Colt Python up against the Dan Wesson model 715. I wonder who would come out on top on that competition. Well, 715 is gorgeous. It is, uh, if I remember right, 1995 uh, MSRP. The Python, I, if I haven't mentioned it yet, is 1495 or 1499 MSRP. Um, do, do you have a Dan Wesson? I do. It's the 44 model that I bought in 1987. It's the big, heavy 744. And it's been a wonderful gun, I tell you. I've had Ruger's, Smith's, and all of them. And this, by far, has been my favorite of all of them is the Dan Wesson, by far, hands down. Well, and you, go, you go back far enough to know, and a lot of people who are new to this don't know what happened with Dan Wesson and how they change revolvers uh, with their whole design, with a barrel sleeve, with a, a threaded nut, with being able to adjust the tension. What happened was back then we were doing um, handgun silhouette shooting. And the Dan Wessons just completely owned those because they were so accurate. And shooting out at 200 yards with those, uh, I mean, when you went down the line, if you were seeing people use revolvers, they were pretty much all using the Dan Wessons, weren't they? Pretty much, yeah. Anybody who really wanted the best quality and accuracy was going with the Dan Wesson back in those times. And also anybody that was really loading up some custom hot ammunition really like the Dan Wesson for its durability. So how's the trigger on the double action trigger pull on your Dan Wesson? I think it's pretty good. It's maybe, it's really smooth. It's um, not really awfully heavy, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's heavier than some others. But overall, I think the smoothest is 
by far out of the box been the best. And I think, honestly, a lot of the attention being paid to the Python is from folks who thought that it would never come back. And I was one of them. I mean, I, way back oh, 10 years ago, I had somebody at Colt told me, we'll never make that again because they destroyed all the machinery. We, all the tools are gone. Everything's gone. You know, it'd be too expensive to make. And so I just was kind of one of those thinking, well, that's gone. It's a shame, but it, we'll never see it again. And these new guys came in there and they said, you know, that's worth doing. And with this modern CNC machinery, we think we can actually make it better than it used to be. And so I think, you know, Part of it is, yeah, it's a really good revolver, but part of it is the nostalgia thing of, man, I always wanted to have one of those. Or I can't tell you how many people this week have said, I sold one of those. I can't believe it was like the worst gun deal I ever made, and now I'm glad I have a chance to get it back. So I'm not sure the people at this point, Brad, are, are kind of going the Python versus others. They're just happy that the Python is back, if that makes sense. Yeah, I I, I do agree with you. Um, and I liked your comment from earlier in the show when you said that it would be nice to see the uh, the big 44 Anaconda come back. I think that would be great as well. Well, I, I think you can almost be assured that's going to happen. And, you know, it'll be a year or more, but I think it's going to happen. Look, i got to keep running here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate being able to talk about the uh, Dan Wesson. Bill is in Liberty, Missouri on one. Hey, Bill, you're on Gun Talk. I understand that... Uh, you're mad at me. Well, I I hadn't been to a local store in a while, and and instead of going to these big box stores, I took your advice and I went to this little gun store and I walked in, and I see her sitting at the end of the counter down there, and I mean, I tried not not to stare so much, but I mean, she was just so gorgeous. And I walked in the end of the store, and I wanted to go back, but I thought, man, nah, she's a little probably a little bit too high, high high class for me. So I left, but I couldn't <laughs> get her off my mind. I just kept thinking about her. Uh-huh. Thinking about her. So the next uh-huh. day, I went back, and when I walked in, I looked. I went down to the end of the counter, and Tom, my heart just dropped because she was gone. Uh-oh. And I thought, oh, man, and what had happened, they had moved her. Okay, what is she? I'm not going to take that chance it? again. So you I did? ended What'd up you get? getting a, a Springfield M1 Grand with 10 clips, not magazines, but clips, and right. a sealed case of the old bald ammo. Oh, man. That's nice. Now, here's the thing. Now, I understand that you said that you're afraid to shoot it. No, 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 yes. no. That, this gun is made to shoot. You just shoot this thing forever and ever. Go shoot the devil out of it, man. Unless you just want to keep it as an investment or something. But I would I would shoot it. Grands are just too cool. Well, so the new, uh, what about the new ammo? Would, would that bother that gun? I don't think so. I think you can shoot new ammo in it. It'll be fine. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Uh, but, I mean, and I understand. It's all cool. It's it's fixed up. It's military style and all the rest of it. And if you want to keep it that way, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But I just hate to hear of any gun not being shot. I don't care how pretty it is. But I congratulate <laughs> you. You, you. Now, here's the deal. Okay, I've been saying over and over and over again, go to your local gun store. Go to your little gun store. You know, forget yeah. these big box stores. Now right. you're a believer. Well, well, Tom, I've always wanted one of these, but I, I just thought I, I've looked at some of them, and a lot of them look like they'd been dragged behind a truck, and I thought, well, I'm not going to pay that right. kind of money for, you know. But this thing was sick. I mean, it was so gorgeous. I mean, the wood is great on it. <laughs> the bluing is good. I mean, it's just so I went ahead and the... and bought it. <laughs> I love it. Well, look, thank you, Bill. I appreciate you sharing that story with us. That is great. You uh, have yourself a, a good uh, 2020 as we head into there. Tell you what, we'll take a quick break here, and then we'll come back. Now, Bill in Knoxville, don't you go anywhere. I want to talk to you when we come back. If you have some thoughts on this church shooting in Texas, has it changed the way you carry? Has it changed what you carry? Love to know that. 866-TALK-GUN.
The Smith & Wesson M&P 380 Shield EZ Pistol revolutionized personal protection with its easy-to-use design. Now, enter the M&P Shield EZ in 9mm. Built for personal and home protection, the Smith & Wesson M&P 9 Shield EZ Pistol features the same easy-to-rack, easy-to-load, and easy-to-shoot design of the M&P Shield EZ series. Available at a retailer near you. Find out more at smith-wesson.com. Mental health and guns. At Walk the Talk America, we are working with both the mental health community and the gun industry. Created by a gun industry veteran, Walk the Talk America seeks to raise awareness and create change through suicide prevention and firearm safety without legislation. We strive to eliminate the prejudice that firearms and mental health face. For more information and to support Walk the Talk America, please visit walkthetalkamerica.org. You got your carry permit, and that's good. But you know you could use more training. Get the DVDs, which have what you need. Springfield Armory presents Concealed Carry 1 and Concealed Carry 2 with Bata Group. Learn specific concealed carry skills from Top Gun fighting trainers. Get trained. Be prepared. This really is life and death. ShopGunTalk.com That's ShopGunTalk.com Tactical professionals who put their lives on the line every day depend on Surefire. Since 1979, Surefire has designed, machined, and assembled the finest flashlights, weapon-mounted lights, hearing protection, and suppressors right here in the U.S. Surefire, offering a best-in-class warranty and customer service, and used by more military special operations, SWAT teams, and hard-use end-users than any other brand. Surefire, American-built, American-strong. Visit Surefire.com. That's Surefire.com. A lot of us have been watching the, uh, going back and watching the video from the church shooting in Texas from a week ago, Sunday. Jack Wilson, he was head of the church security team, former law enforcement. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the deal is. Somewhere along the line, people started reporting saying he was ex FBI. He's not. Never, never been in the FBI. He used to be a deputy or reserve deputy sheriff. Firearms trainer, had a shooting range, taught a lot of people to shoot. But as we look at that, you know, a lot of people, I think, are looking at that and going, Can I, could I make a shot at 35 to 50 feet? Can I make a head shot? Can I get my gun out? By the way, there's a really good phrase that's important to remember. It helps you. is draw quickly, shoot carefully. You can draw quickly. You don't have to shoot quickly. Draw quickly, then take a little half second, a little breath. <sighs> Bang. Press. Don't shoot fast. Well, I mean, unless it's like bad breath distance. Just food for thought. Uh, Bill's with us out of Knoxville, Tennessee. He's on uh, line five. Hey, Bill, talk to me about your church security team. Well, hi, Tom. Uh, I, I've been a member of our volunteer church security team for the last seven years. Um, in, a, in a kind of an ironic sense, we did away with the volunteer security team as of last week, that very day. And the church oh, wow. has decided to go to a law enforcement-based security program. They haven't done away with security, but the volunteers mm-hmm. uh, are not the security anymore. And we were all uh, licensed armed security guards. Uh, we had to pass that qualification. and. Okay. Uh, it's a very interesting and dynamic situation because our church had about 1,500 people in any given service. And mm-hmm. so you, your your cost for inaccuracy is huge. And so we were pretty careful shooters, and uh, most of the people on the security team were well-trained and shooters and, and uh, well-practiced. Um, it's it's a very interesting scenario though. The the guy last week uh did a real good job. I I don't know that I would have gone for a headshot at that distance, but uh he drew, he pointed well, and he, he did a good job. He he said that's the only shot he had. He said uh, because yeah. of the pressure and we're still standing up. Now let me ask you a question. This is I know this is provocative, but I'm gonna ask you yeah, sure. has anybody asked the has anybody asked the police department or these people, these uniformed officers who are in their your church security team now, 
how often they practice or what their qualification scores are? I don't know a lot of information about that. I understand their qualification scores were provided to the church and that Mm -hmm. they accepted their qualification scores as uh, bona fide and and good enough to do that. Um, I don't even know what course of fire they shot. Uh, Obviously, it's for a a law enforcement academy. Uh, But, you know, the, the course of fire you shoot could be simple or it could be very complex. Well, and I, I also know that, and I, I talk to a lot of uh, law enforcement trainers, and mm-hmm. they say, look, when our, their officers have to come back and requalify, you know, it should take 15, 20 minutes to shoot the qualification, but it sometimes takes 30, or not correction, three hours for them to shoot the qualification because the trainers have to spend two to two and a half hours training them to get them back up to where they can actually pass. Because as they walk in to shoot after a year of being out on the street, they are simply not able to pass the qualification scores without being trained up again. And now they're going to go another year with their skills deteriorating without going out and practicing. And so all that to say, I just want people to understand, look, and everybody knows I'm not anti-cop. But no, no. in my experience, a lot, of, and I'm not talking about a few, like a few bad apples, a lot of cops are terrible shots, and even more of them have absolutely atrocious safety habits around guns. Well, you do also have an advantage with uniformed law enforcement. They have their cars parked out front, and uniformed law enforcement officers are a vastly uh, more significant deterrent to yes, people I than, agree completely. than plainclothes I agree completely. security so there's some trade-offs there, but uh, I, I did that for seven years, and this was the first Sunday this morning that I didn't have a radio stuck in my ear, spare magazine carrier, and a big duty sidearm. I have a, a, a little smaller concealed carry pistol, but I'll still carry, And uh, but I'm not responsible for everybody else's safety now, just my own. And You know, here's a, a, here's a, a thought for you. Different. If you haven't done it already, if you're carrying now, and if you're former team is still carrying, you guys need to liaise, if you will, talk with the cops who are there to say, look, guys, we understand you're here and you're primary, but you also need to understand there's a whole bunch of people in this church who are carrying. So do not assume that anybody who pulls a gun out is a bad guy. Uh, The the cops of that church know my face. I've made sure of that. Well, Okay, I mean, that, that's good, but I'm serious. You know, a lot of times in academies, the cops are trained. Their yep. instruction to shoot is the word gun. And yep. so they are being trained up to where if I see a gun, I shoot. And that's horrible training. I don't, I don't think any law enforcement agency should ever use the, the word gun as the signal to draw and shoot. You know, but I just we're kind of thinking about if you guys are still carrying, and God, I sure hope you are. You need to let them know that look, guys, just because you see somebody with a gun, whether they know, you, know your face or not, does not mean that's necessarily a bad guy. At the same time, you guys need to understand that these guys are going to be looking for a gun. You need to conduct yourself accordingly. I guess it's just a case of you guys being talking. It sounds like you are. I appreciate that. And, very, and look, very dynamic you know, situation, and you make good yeah, points. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, Exactly. We're still trying to be safe thank you there. so much. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you for serving and taking care of, you know, providing protection for your congregation. And remember, you're still providing protection for yourself and others. You never know what's going to go on. Be, be careful out there. Hey, Greg, don't go anywhere. We're going to get uh, your, uh, your comments in just a few minutes here. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. Actually, got room for you to join us. 866-TALK-GUN. We'll get you in here. Have you bought a 10 millimeter? Would you ever buy a 10 millimeter? Are you just thinking this is like the stupidest caliber? And there's what's the point? It's like we got nines and forty fives, and why do we need a ten? I don't know. It's fortunately need has nothing to do with it. It's all about what I want. I want. I want. I want. So therefore, I'm going to get it. <laughs> All right, back with you. I've got a couple of emails from people. Uh, we had our caller who had picked up a Garand, asked about ammo, and he said, look, uh, you do need to buy mil-spec ammo, and there is factory mil-spec ammo out there for it's safe for shooting in your Garand. So I appreciate the heads up from those who have sent me the notes. All right, fair enough. Let's see here. Line four, Greg's with us. Carson City, Nevada. Greg, what's on your mind? Hey, Tom, thanks for your program, and thanks for your enthusiasm. So, um, you bet. I had a 
Thanks. Uh, I had a question. Um, you know, you often play the uh, the audio of uh, Charleston Heston on your uh, on your program, and um, so he. I guess he was involved with the NRA back before my time. Can you can you tell me how did he get involved and what level was he involved in in the NRA? Charlton Heston was, was Charlton Heston was the pr- he was the president of the NRA for a couple of years. He was hired help. I mean, I don't want to make too big a deal out of it. He was hired by Ackerman McQueen, the PR firm, just as uh, Ollie Dorth was. Uh, whether or not that's a good thing, we can argue. But, uh, you know, he was enthusiastic. He was willing. He was a gun guy. But make no mistake, this was a, a hired media deal when they made him the president, which I think is a bad, bad idea to hire a celebrity like they did with Oliver North and make him the president of the NRA. I just think it's a bad move. Okay. So, so my question is, why can't we get someone um, someone else involved that has a lot of uh, uh, gun interest that's, that's not using some, this sort of publicity farm? I mean, uh, um, I'm sorry, his name escapes me right now, and I know he's listening right now, but uh, the Wango Tango oh, Ted guy. Nugent. So, yeah, yeah, Ted yeah. Nugent. Well, sorry, right, Ted. Here's the deal. But, Ted, is, Ted is on the NRA board. He's a member of, of the board of directors of NRA. Um, okay. Yeah. The problem I have right now is, and it's like I did last week, anybody who wants to be on the board, anybody who's running for the board on the NRA, what I want to hear from them right now is I want to get rid of Wayne LaPierre because I will tell you, I don't think the NRA is fixable while he and his crew are in there. And make no mistake, the NRA is spiraling down the drain right now. Uh, I mean, anybody that doesn't share that idea or want to tell you that's not true is covering for him. And I will tell you, and one of the things, here's the deal. If you're talking to any NRA board member and they're saying, no, no, everything's fine, ask them, how much are you personally making out of the NRA? How, what kind of contracts do you have? You know, what does your business, what kind of business does your business do with the NRA? Are you getting consulting fees? Mm-hmm. There are a bunch, I mean, here's the dirty truth. There are a bunch of board members of the NRA who are making a lot of money from the NRA, and that only happens as long as they are stay on the good side of LaPierre. And, I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, people can, I don't think people care one way or the other, but until we clean that mess up, the NRA is much, much less effective today than they were a few years ago. And that's horrible for all of us. We need a good, strong NRA. We need good leadership. But we also need it to be cleaned up. We don't need people getting paid $2 million and flying around in private jets and spending a quarter of a million dollars on their custom-made suits, which is what has been happening. And, and, we, and we don't need people who say, oh, looky, our PR agency is overcharging us. We have to do something about it when they have been, in fact, in charge of that vendor, the PR agency, Ackerman McQueen, for 20 years and been part of that whole deal. So, yeah, it makes me angry when I see them destroy my organization, my organization. I want the NRA to be strong. It's as simple as that. Look, I appreciate the call. I'm flat out of time here. Thank you. Let's see. If you're on hold right now, don't go anywhere. We're going to get you into the after show. If you'd like to join us for the after show, we're actually going to be talking about, uh, we're going to get a range report. Michelle has shot the new Ruger 5.7 pistol. We're going to get her to talk about that. That's going to be fun. You can call right now and listen. You can join the conversation, 866-TALK-GUN. Or, of course, you can listen to the after show anywhere you get your podcast. Simple as that. I'm Tom Gresham. Go out, do a little shooting this week. Take someone with you. Have some fun and commit to more training in 2020.